Good morning, and welcome to Redeemer Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Gary Lodholt. Of all the prayers we have been looking at last week and plan to look at this week, today we explore the one you probably know the best, the Lord's Prayer. Last week we began exploring a listing of the top ten prayers in the Bible, five from the Old Testament, and this week five from the New Testament. And maybe you didn't realize that the Lord's Prayer is actually a text from the Bible. In fact, you find the version we know best in the Gospel of Matthew and a slightly different version in Luke. The differences are sort of what you might expect from two different people telling the same story. I remember once reading a theologian who commented that when she tries to pray the Lord's Prayer, she could never get past the first two words, Our Father. There's so much there to think about and to lead us to praise. Our. It's not just my Father, but our Father. We all belong to God, and we are all united together in one humanity, one in being God's people. And that has a lot to say to us about how we treat each other, those dear to us, those near to us, and those far off too, those like us and those much, much different, those from here, those not from here, those who believe like we do and those who don't, those in our, in our societal level and those who aren't, those we agree with and those who differ those we approve of and those we don't. Each of us and all of us are loved children of God and brothers and sisters together. When one is in need, we are all in need. We are a family called to live in love. And then we come to the word Father. And that says so much about God who loves us and cares for us, watches over us and provides for us. Unfortunately, some fathers don't live up to what a father is supposed to be. And that's not the kind of father God is. God provides the best of all. God's love and grace is beyond our understanding. And once again, calling God our father means that we are a family, sharing all that it means to be God's children. And again, that shapes how we live together. Now, as I said earlier, this theologian got so wrapped up in those two words that she was never able to move further into the prayer. And perhaps something like that has happened today, too. We don't really have the time now to go through the prayer line by line. Perhaps we'll do that as a whole week's topic sometime. But there are other issues we need to address for now. If you look at the Bible text, you will note that it seems incomplete from the prayer you know. The last part, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen, isn't there in the Bible. Actually, this part was added on as a statement of praise to God, which is also known as a doxology. The other thing to notice about the Lord's Prayer is that the prayer divides in half pretty easily. The first petitions in the prayer all focus on God, praising God's name, seeking that God's kingdom be established here among us and that God's will be done. Only then do we turn to our own concerns, daily bread, forgiveness, living out forgiveness, and dealing with evil. Prayer involves our concerns, yes, but it also involves seeking God and God's will in our world. Finally, for today, there's the question of whether Jesus intended this prayer to be a model of the kinds of things we should pray for, or whether it was intended for us to use word for word like we use it. The answer is an unequivocal yes. You see, it's both. There's nothing wrong with using it word by word, but it can also serve as a model for our own personal prayers for the kinds of thing we sh things we should pray for. Perhaps that theologian we started with can come back in here too. 
She never got past our Father. Today, I invite you not just to say the Lord's Prayer, but to pray it. Thanks for watching, and remember to let this day belong to God.